Um, so, 20 years since this film was made, how does it feel to sort of know that 20 years later it's still sort of filling out audiences and it's obviously resonated? Yeah, like I, like I said at the beginning, it, it, um, it's, it's annoyingly sometimes, because, you know, you've made things three years ago, that people... Um, this is the one film out of everything. Whenever you kind of someone you know maybe pulls up in the street, who likes your stuff, Dead Man's Shoes just seems to be the one that again and again has connected with people the most. And um, obviously, I wish it was <laughs> something I'd made a year ago. <laughs> but the fact that there's at least one of them, um, yeah, that's ace. How about have you got any any thoughts, um, Mark? It's really weird because I think. We were just talking before. We went to Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago and um, we did a Q&A there. And <clears throat> you forget that some of the things, some of the, dis I mean, we literally, like Shane said in the intro, we met in February, made it in May. Two weeks before we were about to shoot it, it was a comedy. Then we lost our lead actor, as in not Paddy, obviously, sorry, but like, mm -hmm. we l and all these things were really, really, had we had a committee with us, we'd have delayed it. But the best decision we make was just just to keep going with the people we did, and it was a real eye opener for me after 20 years of doing this. Where sometimes you think, you know, and I've actually been sort of reflecting a little bit and going, "Cracky, why don't I do that more? Why don't we do that more often?" You know, sometimes in this industry, there's so many voices, and uh, sometimes it's great, and often it can be great. But on this film, it was just such a singular. I'm watching Shane and Paddy just do what they did, and just like it was, it was like this incredible. We shot in it. 18 days that film was made in. Which, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> no like... No easy feat. Yeah. Um, and what, what is it about this film, do you think? Because I think actually with a couple of your films that you guys have made together, you, you have this is almost sort of cult-like sort of status that it has. And I was sort of talking earlier about, you know, seeing guys have got, like, tattoos of... <laughs> um, uh, you know, Paddy Considine's character, like, on their body, which is, uh, you know, that, that's commitment to the, yeah, to the yeah. fandom. And, I, and, you know, you, you see it a lot. And, and what, what do you think it is about this film that sort of resonates with um, people in that way? I mean, from my point of view, I think audiences um, are, are so much more intelligent than most Hollywoody type filmmakers ever give them credit for. And I think that when you give people the reality of life and they know it's the truth and you know dead man's shoes doesn't kind of pull any punches and i think a lot more people than people realize have seen kind of bullying on that scale mm -hmm. there's something about you know you can you can shoot a hundred people in a schwarzenegger film a thousand people but to show one act of violence um and for it to have the most impact as a filmmaker that's massively attractive because you're kind of going actually you know, the, I, as a kid, I remember that, you know, the moments where I should have maybe stepped in for a friend who was being bullied by older kids, that stayed with me my whole life. You know, that I, I just wished I'd gone and got my head smashed in and been able to live with myself a bit better, you know. And, and so I think there's something irrelevant of class or background or geographical location in Dead Man's Shoes that way, way more people had seen things that I'd seen than I realised. And I think that it resonated because it was it didn't pull any punches yeah. and um you know you think it's maybe your own experience but it turned out to be a lot more people's experience than i realized mm. well i think actually that sort of leads me neatly on because they we're talking especially in this program a lot we're sort of talking about about violence and you know the film is violent there's a lot of violence in the film but it, it to me you've just sort of nailed that you know, sometimes you can kind of overdo it and it alienates people. Um, and I wondered kind of like how much of that you were thinking about when you're making stuff and how much you're kind of making those judgments on like, is this too far? Can people, can people take this? Yeah, I mean, Mark told me something really interesting that I'd completely forgotten, which was we, we weren't sure whether the Richard being present with um, his brother was ever, ever going to kind of be too much... You know, we didn't know whether that was going to work, whether the twist... You don't know when you're doing a twist. If you're not, you know, Agatha Christie, who's written 3,000 twists. <laughs> this is my first, my first uh, rodeo on the twist front. And uh, so I haven't got a clue whether we're, like, really over-egging the twist or the twist is really hard to spot. 
And so Mark reminded me tonight that we shot alternative versions. Every time there was a scene with Toby Kebbell's character in, we'd actually shot alternative versions without him there. Yeah, so that scene we'd shoot without Toby. Yeah, and I didn't In remember. 18 days we shot both, like one with Paddy and one yeah. without, because, you know, the ghost thing and there was Sixth Sense had just come out and it was all <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Pay Toby's It Forward ghost. came out. <laughs> that was annoying. But it was serious, yeah, so we, and you don't know. And I think that's the point I was saying before is that you just, sometimes you've just got to, and you know, and he was here, he was, you know, edit, so many films in the edit are made, you know. I mean, this, as a script, it was like, at one point it was you, you just had Paddy coming in for doing what he would, like, killing everybody, and then you saw all the past at the end, and then we had one where it was at the front, and then Chris, the editor that came on board and finished the film, who was here, is, is here somewhere, um, just sprinkled it liberally after about nine months of editing, and it just changed the whole, you know, and this is the thing about, it's just such a, the process is like, it was amazing, but what we did in that is just give ourselves the option to kind of go, if the ghost doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, can, yeah. we can do another cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It was just one of those that we, we'd, we'd never really worked in that way before, and so we sort of created a trapdoor but then in the end just kind of went, you know, let's just see what happens. And so as it turned out, it feels like we accidentally got the measurement just about right, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I watched it again the other day for the first time in a while and I totally forgot until about halfway through. I was like, oh yeah, he's a ghost. I completely <laughs> forgot about that, which is what, what you want really, I think, because you know, you could have played it quite differently. Yeah. Um, but it's quite, it's probably the closest thing I would say to sort of horror in a way that you've, that you've probably made together, I'd think. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it, I think from my point of view, that those kind of moments, you know, growing up in smaller places, you're kind of raised as a kid. And I can remember when the heroin epidemic was kicking off in the 80s and you always felt like it's never going to land here. It's things that happen in cities. And then it landed in Utopsy to where I was from and very close friends and members of the family were going under and you realize small towns aren't immune to the extremities um of of the universe you know and 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 it was kind of uh, you know that that sense as a, as a kid kind of growing up laughing your ass off one minute at the funniest thing you've ever seen and then ending up someone just someone different rolls up at the park with a different energy <laughs> and the next 24 hours of your life are fucking miserable, you know, yeah. and, and you're just trying to escape the situation. So it was kind of putting a bit of your life on screen. Um, but at the same time, there was something about that revenge thriller. In a way, you know, the things that you, you wished you'd done or you, that, that you wished you'd stepped up to the plate, mm -hmm. Richard became a kind of device um, to sort of step in and right the wrongs of things you maybe wished you'd done different yourself in the past. Yeah, and, and I wonder if perhaps that is what makes him this cult figure where it's like he's almost like lived out the fantasy of many people who... It's Highway to Heaven with a <laughs> switchblade. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. Kind of comes up to make things better but keeps whacking everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, about your sort of process of um, working with actors, but actually before that I wanted to talk about... You obviously touched on it earlier, you gave us this lovely visual of you in your pants and you guys having that, <laughs> that first meeting. But, you know, this, this was the first film you made together, but obviously wasn't the last. And I'd love to chat a little bit about your, your relationship and how, how you guys work, because obviously that, that director-producer relationship is uh, it's fragile, it's important, it's all of those things. I think the thing, I mean, as it was my first feature film as a producer. I just done, I think I'd just done Phoenix Nights, a, another, a, my first producing gig for for anything, but I'd, I'd, it's that crazy thing, and I think I see it now, is that, I, you know, we grew up in this, I mean, I wasn't, I grew up in Connorsborough, this mining town in um, near Doncaster, and uh, I think we just sort of, it's that really weird thing when somebody des describes a scene, whether it's Paddy or Shane, just describing something, and you kind of go, yeah, yeah, I've got that, you know, so, and actually with on This Is England, you sort of talk about, the combos and the Sean's and the Woodies, you know, I remember when Shane, brilliant off This Is England, like, was sort of like stuck out for Joe Gilgan on Wood, because we all knew that the guy, it wasn't the most good looking, muscular jock that came, it was the guy who made everyone laugh. And I think because we kind of grew up in the same place, somehow there was this kind of, mm. there was almost like a, 
a shorthand mm. that we'd probably develop before we met. <laughs> yeah, it was like we were at school together, but we'd both been expelled, so yeah. we didn't meet. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's interesting, actually, because that's something I hear about your, your work a lot. I was actually reading um, uh, Toby Kebble, who played um, Anthony, saying that it was just like, you know, the shoot was kind of like pissing around with your mates, but you're just in a field rather than, you know. Yeah. Um, and that sort of experience, and, and your, your work does feel a little bit sometimes like you're sort of being let in on a bit of a joke that's going on, and you're yeah. all sort of like, oh, okay, you know, it feels quite an easy way in. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. Um, so, I w yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about, um, about how you're sort of working with your cast there, because it is something, there's like a real, like, sort of Shane Meadows acting school I think that, that, that you know I was watching Gallows poll earlier which obviously is, is one of the newest things you've made yeah. and it's you can still see the through line you know through it all yeah I, th I think what I've realized and I, it, it probably happened you know I, I don't know maybe maybe with Romeo Brass with like Paddy um you know Vicky and Shimmy that Bob Hoskins was it was amazing on 24 7 as well where when you've got people that maybe doing their their first feature film there's something about if you've got a load of people that have been doing been in the game 20, 30 years, you know, and they all start competing about who's got the biggest caravan and you know drivers, and when you get someone in who's seeing it for the first time, who can't believe they were picked up in the morning, can't believe someone's asking them if they want a cup of tea, they're being dropped <laughs> off, they're being given every meal, they're being fed three times a day, and that person's going, this is the best thing I've ever had in my life, and some mardos. It was caravans an inch smaller than the next Mardos's caravan. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really healthy environment. And it's kind of what you realise, you know, I mean, someone like Thomas Turgoose is what's the, I think the ultimate balance is, is that mix of people with experience working with people who are doing it for the first time. Because the people that are doing it the first time scare everyone to death who's got experience because mm -hmm. they're able to do it without even trying um, and uh, not make an excuse, you know, and, and it creates this. For me, a, a great feature film should be like a summer holiday you had as a kid. You know, you, you kind of, the first two weeks are ace and everyone loves each other, then you hate them for a bit. And then you know, sort of agree to disagree at the end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's funny. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, and then someone ends up with a moustache that they didn't have at the beginning. And, uh, and they change and then they move away with Lee Taylor and, and you don't see him again. But, yeah. but fundamentally, it's... What, what I think what maybe creates that real sense of friendship is the fact that people with experience are having to put their arm around, you know. So I remember Thomas Turgus, you know, in, uh, in This Is England, Toby Kebble doing his first one, Paddy had done a few films by that point. And it's that sh people, rather than being protective over their art, actually sharing and saying, you know, and, and, you know, and being generous with other people. And it creates that sense of camaraderie that hopefully brings people in. And then by the end of This Is England 90, they were all arguing over like, yeah. trailers of yeah. who's got the yeah. biggest one. No one, all knew, no one knew to bring me in. <laughs> they, all had their own, they all went one day and had a few beers in the afternoon and got their names tattooed, genuinely, the cast names tattooed on their arse. <laughs> like the credits, plus me and Shane. And so we reminded three of them that they got scenes in the bath. And yeah, so it is, it is, it's like, it's crazy. It is like literally looking after sort of like Mm. Naughty kids at Boston. I will say I was at a junket for This Is England 90 years ago and I, they got their asses out, I saw. They love to get their asses out. It's not they just still a, an urban myth. Yeah, they're no, they're they tattoos. Andrew Shim turned up for a day of shooting having been to a, a mixed martial arts first cage fight on a 1,000cc Yamaha motor. <laughs> you know, like every way he could possibly try and die before he <laughs> kind of got there. It was incredible. Yeah. You, know, you, know, you do realise if you have a sort of swollen face and it eases over oh, the... I've just got to say one thing, because another thing I've just remembered about this, the drug scene where um, Paddy goes in and, you know, the amazing scene that, we, that, was, that was a day's filming. The night before, they'd all gone out and got hammered in Matlock at this really shit club. <laughs> remember? Yeah. And, like, they were up until four o'clock and it was, like, it was terrible. I've been to shit clubs, I've... I was born in Doncaster. I really <laughs> am. <laughs> uh, but you use that. Do you remember? Because yeah. they were absolutely... So when you see them at the end, when they're absolutely battered, they were battered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even joking. No, you're dead right. Me. Let's do it. Yeah, let's I do it I think some today. of them had fights with each other. Yeah, 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 they all, yeah, yeah. They'd all had fights with each other. <laughs> I had to pick them up at about half four in Matlock Bath, and it was just... <laughs> but anyway, but the, what was point is that had we had a schedule that was tight and, a, and somebody to ring up and go, can we do... We're going to change it. It was like, they're all battered, let's do this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Proper method then. Yeah. <laughs> committed, committed to the bit. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit just about the characters that sort of feature in, in a lot of your work and actually to talk about Warp sort of more broadly. There does seem to be, or certainly there was for a while, um, something of a fascination with some of these protagonists, the ones that we're sort of talking about more widely in the programme too. You know, these these guys who... Yeah, as I sort of explained previously, you might not want to get on the wrong side of, or might want to yeah. be stuck in a you know a loo like talking to them. What what do you think it is about these characters that that you were both quite drawn to? I mean, yeah, it's one dude. If no, you... I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, from my point of view, as a kid, um, I needed a form of protection, really. And and so when my sister started, you know, so I was, when I was like 10 or 11, my sister would be 13, 14, and then she'd have a boyfriend that was 16, 17, a skinhead. I was getting bullied like fuck up as a kid and having a nightmare as a young kid. My dad was away a lot and I didn't, I didn't want to tell my dad I was being bullied because I, I wanted to be braver than I was. And so my sister suddenly turns up with these kind of characters around the house and everyone in the town shit scared of them. So my instant thing is, right, I hang around with them. I look like them. You know, I am them. Mm. And no one tries to smash my face in or do other crazy shit to me. And so in a way, when you're younger, um, it's a means of survival, I think. And it was for me personally. Um, And so what starts to happen is as you get older, these kings of shitty castles. Um, it's a bit like in Friends, they did it really well. There was like some dude that Monica and Rachel wanted to go out with who had a bike called Chip, and then he oh, still yeah. had the same frigging bike. <laughs> <laughs> and he was loads shorter than everyone remembered, and nowhere near as hard. And it's kind of, it's a bit like that. You know, they kind of take on an iconic status in your youth, um, but then as you grow into a man and you have kids and you grow up, you maybe realise, that you know, that obviously some of the characters from my life, the people that got me into Trojan reggae and and the real reason to be a skinhead were amazing, but then there was some right-wing dudes that had awful ideas, you know. But as a kid, I was just thinking, you know, I was just jumping from the next protection racket to the next one. It didn't really matter mm. what, the, what shit the person was spouting. Mm. That's really interesting. You, have you been thinking? Well, no, I've just been... <laughs> no, it's weird, it's weird, because, like I say, it's a weird, weird one for me, because I'm going to watch it with my 24-year-old daughter for the first time on Friday in Sheffield, the 35 mil print, and, you know, having got three kids and just talk, just thinking about, you know, I'm a couple of years older than you, I think, aren't oh, no, so I? 71, and, it's, and I remember, you know, when we made this Stone Roses uh, doc about 10, 12 years ago, and we were just talking about going about like w- working together is that yeah, I remember this ama- this really really hard life of like and then going to a new school and get, getting bullied and being all right because you were all right at football and just seeing and it was just this really and then and then I um, got to 18 in 1989 and went off I just went traveling for a year and came back and everyone was doing E and uh, <laughs> and those guys were just like that were like smacking each other in the Back of an ankle would suddenly like head massaging each other, <laughs> just sort of like. Yeah. And I think, and, and I just remember just going, "Oh my, my cousin David, he was an animal. Um, <laughs> he was an animal, and he was just suddenly like, hey, Mark, let's do, you know." And it was just like, and it was, I was like, "What's going on?" And then this music, and I just, and I think that going back to this, this whole when you, you know, like that, and I try to describe this to my kids now when there was no phones and you used to meet each other with a pager and go to a rave or whatever. It's just, I want to, cher- this, there's this moment in our history that I'm really like, I think is incredible. And I just think that, you know, like, and, and you want to tell stories about these people, like not men and women and, and mums and dads and kit, you know, like it was just this transformative, I don't think we'll ever get that again. Mm. You know, like going to a rave. Hmm. 
on meeting at services on the M1 and not knowing where you're going at like yeah. 11 o'clock and then like you know and then and then losing your wife at the sort of like and then seeing her two days later <laughs> I mean like I'm She's just married to yeah. Gerard Depper do yeah <laughs>
you know, like if it wasn't for Mark and having that confidence in just Mark just going, because what Mark did really cleverly was raise the minimum amount of money for the maximum amount of creative control. So yeah, we could have got Benny Hill back on screen <laughs> yeah. and I wouldn't have complained too much. Um, so when we went back in and said, we're not kind of making this comedy you've signed up for, and we spoke to them honestly about it, because there wasn't this enormous risk financially, they backed us, you know, and obviously Paddy, you know, myself and Mark all spoke honestly about why we wanted to change it. And so for the, really, we were just making a film for a reason about something very sort of specific. And then it, that's when it really caught fire, I think. And I think just as a producer, I just, I saw those shorts and um, I think I watched about 12 in one day. Just on, and, um, one, Paddy's got a wig, one, he's got a hat, one, he's got some false teeth, one, he's got... And these characters were just, and I was like, where, uh, how long did that take you to film one day? Edit, one, and it was just like, it blew my mind because I was a location manager before and production manager, and, I, and I was, I'd just done some big things where the circus came into town and it was like a huge beast to turn, it was like a tanker. And for, it, it was just this like, I don't know, it just was this like bit of going. And also what was really interesting is Paddy, who was on fire at that time, had just done amazing work. He was tied into a film that was shooting in the, in, in the States. And we only had him May the... I can remember it now, because my birthday is May the 6th. We had him from May the 7th until the end of May. So that was it. And that, that was... We were, not, we were gonna make this film or, or we wouldn't never have made this film. And so all these things that, we kept, that kept happening that were like obstacles thrown at us, and there were some huge ones, we just kept going, well, fuck it, we'll do it. You know? <laughs> and we had Film 4 and Peter Carlton now works with, work, works with Warp, who was at EM Media at the time, just an optimum releasing Now Studio Canal, just went, yeah, we'll back it. You know? And because, and it was just, just, just this real amazing thing where people just went, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, for the money, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and it's, I wish they did it all the time now. Yeah. I actually think that's a really good note to end on because also we're out of time. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think if there are any, any filmmakers in the audience, I think that attitude of sometimes you do just have to see, see what you can manage and then you end up making this, you know, incredible mm. film that sells out uh, the NFT one and people still really enjoy and love uh, 20 years on. Uh, so thank you both of you so much for coming down and talking to us um, today. If anyone is in, is it in Sheffield? There's a, there's a screening that's going to be. Yeah. If any of you've right. made the pilgrimage down uh, here and, and want to go doing back. One in yeah. I'm doing one in Nottingham next week, yeah. Amazing, and I think there's oh, some more. Um, uh, yeah, there are, there are some more. Oh, in Matlock. What, Matlock? <laughs> is, is there one on in Matlock? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> They're asking you. They want to know. Right. <laughs> is there a, I mean, there was that cinema in Belper, but is there a cinema now in Matlock? Uh, well, it's now like a it's, thing I thought it was. I, yeah, yeah. Loads of people. There's, there's a lot of big tellies. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a 55-inch plasma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> House uh, speaker. We can. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much, and please uh, join me in. Thank, thank you. you.